Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Welcome. My name is Bianca Collins. I'm the curator of public programs for the Fowler Museum at UCLA. Thank you for joining us today or tonight, depending on where it is you're tuning in from around the world. The Fowler is proud to present today's program, Jason de Leon and the Undocumented Migration Project, as part of our Curator's Choice series, in which we join curators for conversations about their passions and projects that inspire audiences to engage with different worldviews. Jason de Leon is an anthropologist whose research interests include theories of violence and Latin American migration. He is the executive director of the Undocumented Migration Project, a long-term study of clandestine border crossing intended to understand the phenomenon in a variety of geographic contexts, particularly those of Northern Mexican border towns and the Southern Mexico-Guatemala border. Today, we are joined by the Fowler's chief curator, Matthew H. Robb and De Leon for a discussion inspired by photographs of the Mexican border in 1920 from the LA Times archive, currently displayed in the Map in the Territory exhibition at Fowler. We will learn about De Leon's research and recent travels as part of Hostile Terrain 94, an art project that brings together about 3,200 handwritten toe tags representing migrants who have died trying to cross the Sonoran Desert of Arizona between the mid-1990s and 2019. Matthew H. Robb has served as chief curator of the Fowler since 2016. Prior, he was the first curator of the Arts of the Americas at the De Young Museum in San Francisco. Rob holds an undergraduate degree from Princeton University, a master's degree from the University of Texas at Austin, and a PhD from Yale University. Matthew is going to give Jason a proper introduction next, but before we get going, I have a few quick technical bits of housekeeping. Once the screen sharing begins, I encourage you to click view options and then select side by side mode so the video feed doesn't cover any of the presentation. And if you have any questions during this program, please do submit them through the Q&A function found at the bottom of your Zoom screen. You can submit and upvote questions that you would like to be considered to be answered at the end of the program. All right, that's enough for me. Over to you, Matthew. Uh, thank you, Bianca, for that uh, very kind introduction and to all of you for joining us from wherever you are today. Um, I wanted to get started a little bit on uh, the history of the, um, uh, or, or just where the idea for this, this program came from out of the, the exhibition that we have up right now, the map and the territory, um, 100 years of collecting at UCLA up through um, October 24th. So you still got a, a couple of weekends left to come and check it out um, at the Fowler Museum on campus. Um, I also wanted to take this opportunity to, to represent uh, the land acknowledgement that you saw as part of our opening set of slides uh, and to indicate some of the work that the Fowler does to try and actualize that statement um, in a number of different ways. And included in the exhibition um, that we'll talk a little bit about today, we have two installations from uh, two Tongva artists, uh, Mercedes Dorme and River Garza. They kind of open the show and close the show. Um, and both of those installations really reflect on what it means for institutions to collect objects objects, what it means for those institutions to hold on to them, uh, and what it means to draw different kinds of borders and boundaries between people and disciplines, uh, between people and places, and to think of ways that we can draw new connections between, um, uh, between those things, between those objects and between people. Um, and ultimately that connection between objects and places and people is a lot of what um, their installations are about as well as um, some themes of the show. Um, so I encourage you to come and see those installations and learn more about the works um, of those two artists. Uh, as I mentioned, and as Bianca was uh, also describing, uh, one of the themes in the exhibition is, is uh, borders and boundaries. It's one of the exhibition sections. And it really does um, consider the ways in which borders affect us individually, as parts of different communities, and as parts of different nation states. Um, and the exhibition includes all kinds of objects drawn from um, different collections at UCLA, from the Fowler and the Library, uh, Special Collections, the Hammer, and the Grunewald Center for Graphic Arts, the Clark Library, 
the ethnomusicology department and the, the list goes on. But I wanted to focus now on um, just some, some early maps um, that we have in the exhibition, uh, particularly this map um, from the early 18th century um, that like a lot of maps from this time period shows California um, as an island, um, simply because the, the cartographers had not really um, come to understand what the indigenous people uh, clearly already knew um, that that's just a peninsula part of a part of a much larger coastline. And, and so it's a reminder of how um, these national borders that seem uh, often so fixed and rigid to us um, are, are really um, illusory and, and unstable. And they've been constructed and built and defined um, and moved and changed uh, over time. Um, and so we have a group of these maps um, in the exhibition uh, to sort of uh, touch on these different issues. Um, and uh, that that gives you a sense of the, the sweep and the scale of the geography in this part of the continent and these different kinds of perceptions and misperceptions um, of what the landscape was actually like. Uh, and just to give you an, another kind of sense of the distorted scale, the, the, little, the little dot in the lower right hand corner of the map, that's actually Mexico City. So you sort of get a sense of how um, compressed and distorted this geography is. Um, is. Um, this map uh, is actually not in the exhibition, but I think it's an important one for a conversation today with Jason uh, to understand again that the border that now exists between the US and Mexico um, is relatively recent um, and highly contested uh, as recently as the middle of the 19th century. Um, so this is a map from 1847 uh, when Texas had actually started to change hands um, as a territory, but there are vast stretches obviously of what's now the Western United States um, that at this point um, were still part of Mexico. Mexico. Um, and that, of course, would all change with the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo in 1848, uh, when the border that we now know um, as citizens of the United States um, and citizens of Mexico came uh, more or less into existence. But there are uh, variations along that storyline or timeline as well. Um, in the exhibition, and this is really what prompted this, the, the conversation of my thinking about um, uh, hearing from Jason, um, we have a suite of photographs that are drawn from the collection of the LA Times Photographic Archive. Um, and that entire archive is part of UCLA's uh, UCLA Library Special Collections. Um, and most of these were made in the, in the late 1920s. Um, uh, the photos themselves um, were made with um, uh, silver, silver nitrate negatives, and those negatives are very, very fragile. Um, in fact, they're even sort of quasi flammable. Um, and so we're grateful to the library for going to these efforts to, to preserve and digitize them um, and providing us with these very, um, with what you'll see in the exhibition are actually um, digital prints from um, scans of these uh, silver nitrate negatives. And, and, um, and you can see really here how, how simple the border was in different parts um, uh, of that line uh, drawn across um, the Rio Grande and then farther west um, in comparison to the heavily militarized um, and built up environment um, that we know today. Uh, I don't wanna underestimate the difficulties of crossing the border at this point in time. Um, obviously there are official um, paperwork and authorizations um, uh, even even in, in this time period, but I don't think there's any sense of, of the of the kind of um, lengthy delays for hours and hours um, that people who cross the border on a daily or an um, annual basis um, experience on the official crossings. Um, in these contexts, you just see very simple gates, very simple buildings um, that allow you to move across um, this artificial line um, quite uh, easily, quite visibly. You can see what's over on the other side. Um, and, and that led me to this, this um, understanding or, or this thinking about, you know, wanting to talk to somebody about like, what's the border like today? Why is it the way that it is? Um, and for that, there's really um, no better uh, person that I wanted to talk to um, uh, about this, the impact that the border has on people's lives um, than our speaker today, Jason de Leon, who's been working in this region for um, many years now. Um, uh, as uh, Bianca mentioned, um, Jason's a professor in anthropology and uh, Chicano, Chicano and Central American Studies at UCLA and um, the executive director of the Undocumented Migration Project that we'll hear a little bit about, um, as well as president of the board of the Calibri Center for Human Rights, uh, which is a nonprofit that seeks to identify and repatriate remains of people um, who've died uh, while migrating through that um, Sonora Desert Crossing in Arizona. Uh, before coming to UCLA, Jason taught in the anthropology department at the University of Michigan, University of Washington. He received his PhD 
in anthropology from Penn State in 2008, um, and his bachelor's degree at anthropology here at UCLA uh, in 2001. So his, his connection which we'll, to UCLA um, and the Fowler and the Coatsen we'll hear more about uh, in our conversation. Um, he, in addition to be a Dodgers fan and a noted punk rock drummer, um, he's also the author of an award-winning book, the cover of which you see here, The Land of Open Graves, Living and Dying on a Migrant Trail, um, and is the 2017 uh, MacArthur Fellow. Um, so we'll hear more about his work today, and I hope that the conversation will help us understand that the border that we have today, um, why it is the way that it is uh, in part, and also to understand that it hasn't always been this way um, and does not need to be this way uh, in the future. So Jason, uh, thanks so much for coming. Um, really appreciate it. Um, you taking the time out of your schedule to talk to us today. Thank you, um, Matthew and, and Bianca for those very warm um, introductions. And I'm, I'm looking forward to chatting more about uh, the Fowler and about the Coatsen and about UCLA uh, in the, in the Q&A. <clears throat> um, I'm going to talk today about the US-Mexico border um, how we have sort of gotten to this point where we are. Um, but before I do that, um, I just want to kind of give a little bit of background. So much of the work that I do um, happens under the rubric of the Undocumented Migration Project, which is a um, which is now a, a 501c3 nonprofit based in Los Angeles, um, but also a research collective um, based at UCLA. That's a combination of many, many uh, methodological approaches of so ethnography, archaeology, forensic science, um, and quite a bit of, of museum and um, exhibition work. And all of these things are, are different approaches that I've employed um, both along the US-Mexico border as well as in Mexico and the southern Mexican border to try to understand the day-to-day -day experiences of, of migrants uh, to help raise awareness about those things, but also then to, to translate those experiences for, um, for different audiences. Um, <clears throat> I am happy to report that as of a few months ago, the Colibri Center for Human Rights, which as Matthew mentioned is a, a, a nonprofit that seeks to um, identify and work with family, uh, identify uh, bodies found in the Sonora Desert of Arizona and help families repatriate those bodies back to their home communities. Uh, we have recently joined forces um, with the UMP, and so now I'm um, I'm wearing two, I'm wearing two hats, and for the moment, and then eventually these two things will 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 verge will will merge together by the end of the year um, under one under one umbrella project. Um, but we're, we're we're super excited about this um, about this um, this new collaboration, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about the work that Colibri is doing. But you can check out our, our website undocumentedmigrationproject.org to to learn more right now about um, about what's happening with us. Um, so just quickly, you know, we have just come out of a previous uh, presidential um, administration that made a lot of promises to us about uh, border walls, border walls that were going to be built by um, by foreign countries that were both never realized or at least never completed. Um, but and, and what was completed actually ended up costing uh, U.S. taxpayers hundreds of millions of dollars, if not if not more. Uh, and I think one of the things that, that we failed to recognize when we had these conversations about um, US, the U.S.-Mexico border and, and border walls is the fact that um, that number one, law enforcement on the ground recognizes that 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 physical walls don't really work, and so therefore we've been employing other strategies for a very very long time as a way to deter people. And since the mid 1990s and up until this very moment right now, the primary border enforcement strategy that we use from California all the way to um, to Texas is a is a policy called prevention through deterrence, and this policy. Um, which I write about extensively in my in my first book, Land of Open Graves. Um, this policy was was spelled out pretty clearly in the mid 1990s, and it really is based on two fundamental principles. The one is the recognition that the U.S. Mexico border cuts across very remote and difficult to traverse terrain. So deserts, mountains, huge areas of of, uh, of unpopulated, um, you know, rural rural environments that are um, really really challenging for for people to get across. Um, the second part of this is that these um, difficult to, to traverse terrains can be used as a weapon. And so in the mid-1990s, the, the U.S. Border Patrol started to funnel people away from urban ports of entry. So um, San Ysidro, which we saw um, in one of those photos, um, El Paso, and we started to push people away from those zones by using hyper-infrastructure in those locations and then 
forcing people or squeezing them to more more remote areas. And the idea was that we could use this this environment, which was deemed a quote hostile terrain of things like the Sonora Desert, we could use that environment as a natural impediment to movement. And so if we push people towards those locations, it, they'll have to walk great distances, you know, they'll have to, um, you know, get across these huge, difficult to, to, um, um, to walk across deserts. And those experiences should then slow people down and give the Border Patrol um, tactical advantage. And they refer to those, to those lands often as, as hostile terrain, which will become important when we talk about um, our, our ongoing exhibition. Um, so we, we did that for a long time, the U.S. government. We pushed people away from um, these urban zones towards um, the Sonora Desert of Arizona, um, where we went from having maybe 10 to 20,000 migrants being apprehended in a given year you know, in southern Arizona to now more than half a million migrants coming through um, in, in, in one calendar year. Um, and the idea is very simple. If you go to a place like Arizona, these port of entries, they have a physical wall that only extend maybe three or four miles in either direction, and then they completely stop. And this is because, and so people can hop the fence, or or more easily, they can walk, um, they can walk three or four miles in each direction, and then just walk around the fence and end up in um, in the desert. But the idea is that it doesn't matter if you get get across that fence because now you've got to walk um, dozens of miles and potentially weeks to get to a place like like Tucson or Phoenix, where then you can be picked up by a smuggler and driven to the location uh, where you want to go. And so you've got to deal with extreme environments. So you know you can freeze to death in the winter in Arizona, um, in the in the mountains. You can die of dehydration in the summer. You're dealing with um, lots of venomous um, animals and just a, a generally very rugged environment that um, that people are, are oftentimes wholly unprepared for to get across on foot. And so we've been using the, the, the desert as this sort of um, um, you know, this this uh, horizontal wall, basically, that instead of being a, a wall like this, it goes this way for miles and miles. And the idea is that if you try to get across this, you will suffer, you may you may end up dying. And really people, um, a lot of people have died um, during this, this crossing process. The thinking was that early on, if enough people died, they would stop coming and word of mouth would spread that it was too dangerous and people would and people would no longer attempt this this risky crossing. But that, of course, has not been the case. Prevention through deterrence goes into place in the mid-1990s. In those days, we had relatively low numbers of deaths, probably under 40 or 50 deaths across the entire U.S.-Mexico border, to now suddenly hundreds of deaths in Arizona alone as a direct result of this policy. Um, so there is a direct positive correlation. This policy goes into place, people start crossing to the desert where they never have had before, and now they start to die in very high numbers. Um, and at this point in Arizona alone, we've got 3,644 recovered bodies, although um, I've argued in many places that this number is low. Migrant bodies are destroyed by nature and by scavenging animals very quickly in this environment. And so this does not represent the actual number of people who have perished in this, um, um, in the, in this place. Um, and it continues to get more and more dangerous, even as migration flows have gone up and gone down. Um, um, across various administrations, migrant death has continued to rise. And last year was one of the most deadly deadly years um, in Arizona history. And our folks at the Colibri Center of Human Rights tell me that we're likely to surpass this number by the end of the year. We're already at about 190 recovered sets of human remains, um, and we still have three months to go. Um, and so it just keeps getting more and more dangerous as people are trying to avoid um, detection up in the mountains or in the most remote parts of the desert. And when you start to map it out, these thousands of deaths, it makes it clear that this is, in fact, a humanitarian crisis happening on U.S. soil. Um, thousands of people have died um, in this location, and they continue to die, um, unfortunately, today. And the Border Patrol recognizes early on, like I said, they thought that if people died um, in the first few years of the program, that they would stop coming. Um, they started to use things like the number of deaths in, in a given year as a way to measure the success of this policy. So one of the predicted outcomes, if prevention through deterrence was successful, would be a rise in migrant death. Um, they noted that deaths were probably going to go up, uh, and um, unfortunately that's been the case. They have not slowed down. They've continued to rise over the years. Um, people know it's dangerous, but they continue to come. And I would argue in general that that the fact that these are these are undocumented people, I think many people don't don't care about that. Um, I think the, the federal government views migrant bodies and migrant lives as expendable. And so therefore, we don't treat this as a humanitarian crisis, but rather as a, 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 a problematic result of the cost of doing enforcement. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm happy to talk more about this in the, in the, in the Q&A. 
And so I've been very interested in raising awareness about this issue um, through multiple platforms, whether that's writing about it, making documentary films, which we've done recently, um, doing a lot of media outreach, but also a significant amount of exhibition work. And um, we currently have a, an ongoing global um, exhibition called Hostile Terrain 94, which um, is basically thousands of handwritten toe tags that represent those who have died while crossing the U.S.-Mexico border from the mid-90s up until today. Um, this number keeps, we keep, we keep adding to it. Uh, these are handwritten toe tags where the orange tags represent those who have been unidentified, and that's um, over 1,300 individuals, and then, um, you know, well over 2,000 folks who, who have been identified. And the premise of Hostile Terrain 94 is very simple. We ask our partners, we ask our hosting institutions um, around the globe to, to mobilize their communities. We send them blank toe tags, we send them all the information that's needed to, to fill out those tags, and we ask their community members to then do that. Um, this installation um, is intended to be a kind of pop-up DIY. Anybody can host it. Um, it's been in fancy galleries, it's been in churches and community centers, it's been on public streets. Anybody can do it. Um, and in as long as they have they have a wall where they can mount these tags and enough people to fill out the, the toe tags. Um, we have currently about 40 some odd shows happening um, um, this fall. This is a, a time lapse from um, a Hostile Train 94 exhibition at Mississippi State in Starksville, uh, Mississippi that I just came back from um, a few weeks ago. And so as you can see here, it takes a lot of people to both um, fill out the tags, which you'll see some folks sitting here on the ground um, in a minute filling out tags. And then it takes lots of individuals to to pinpoint the exact location of where those individuals were found on a, on a giant wall. So there's a grid that we lay out that has the exact location of these, of these individual cases. And then folks have to come in with a pin or with, with a nail and, and, and fill that in um, in those locations. So it's a very laborious and, and time consuming process. But you know, for me, the important part of it is this participatory um, nature. It's the act of sitting down for a few minutes, um, writing out the names of the dead and information for them, and, and bearing witness for a moment. And the goal is to take this static, kind of two-dimensional digital image of migrant death and make it into something that is both three-dimensional, but also something that, um, you know, that, that's been translated into a human experience through the act of writing and the act of, of witnessing. And, um, you know, I think people are very, very much moved by um, the labor it, it takes to build, to build one of these exhibitions. Um, I will say that on a personal level, you know, I am very committed to this issue because of my own um, engagements with, with migrant death in the Arizona desert. This is a tag that I that I've often fill out for a 31-year-old mother of three from Ecuador named Carmita Maricela Zaguipuya, who died in 2012 and whose body I found um, um, that summer. And so ended up working with her family to try to understand what had happened to her. Um, and I write about her um, extensively in my, my first book. Um, and, you know, it was through Mar Maricela's family that I also became connected with another, with another case, um, um, a, a missing persons case. And I should just have you know that at, at Colibri, you know, we are a small nonprofit who are working very, very tirelessly um, to identify these bodies that the federal government has no interest in identifying. And we currently have over 3,300 missing persons cases in Arizona alone, as well as 1,338 unidentified sets of remains um, at the medical examiner that we are trying to, to raise money to, um, to, to help identify. Um, and, you know, you get a sense of those, the, the, these thousands of people when you, when you look at one of these maps and you look at the number of orange tags representing these unnamed individuals. And, you know, for me... Um, through, it was through Maricela's story that I got to know the story of a 15-year-old kid from also from Ecuador named Jose Maria Tacuri, who disappeared in the summer of 2013 and has never been um, seen from since. Um, I've worked extensively with his family. I've spent a lot of time in the desert trying to, to figure out his last um, known location. But also now, you know, I think a huge part of my motivation is just seeing whether or not um, we can identify Jose. Um, you know, is he one of these orange tags that we have just not been able to um, to pay for the DNA analysis yet to, to do the identifications? And so, um, you know, each one of these tags represents um, an individual story um, of loss, but also a story of loss that has impacted families on, on, on both sides of the border.
and I'm happy to talk more about this um, in the Q&A, and people can also learn more about this on our website, um, through my uh, the book Land of Open Graves. Radio Lab a few years ago did a three-part series on my book called The Border Trilogy that really gets into some of these um, 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 stories as well, so people can go there um, and, and learn a lot more. Um, and, you know, if you're interested in, in seeing the exhibition, we, we hope to install over 130 by the end of 2023. Uh, across six continents um, we have um, a whole bunch of shows up right now I just came back from Europe where, where there were five or six shows happening um, I also just came back from the from the south where we had shows in Mississippi um, Alabama and um, in Tennessee we will have some shows opening here in, in Southern California soon um, the Museum of Us exhibition will open uh, November 12th so just in, in about a month uh, so I'm gonna encourage you to if you're interested in seeing this in person you can go there um, the La Plaza de Cultura y Artes here in LA will have a hostile terrain show next fall but we're also hoping to have um, shows across Southern California including East LA College um, and, and we hope at UCLA as well so check out our website if you're interested in, um, in learning about a show that might be happening near you and how you can get involved and then, you know, finally, I just want to say that uh, I would encourage you to check out our website. Um, you know, the the Undocumented Immigration Project and Colibri, we are um, a very small nonprofit, um, a very small staff, and we have to raise all our money ourselves right now to, to pay for these DNA analyses. Uh, we are in the midst of our fall fundraiser. So um, if you're interested in helping, um, learning about our mission and, and, and supporting us, you can go to our website. Um, we have a, a, a silent auction that will start in about a week. So lots of cool things people can bid on there, but also a lot of other ways that you can um, learn about our mission and, um, and, and get involved. And I'll stop there and thank you. Well, thanks, Jason. Um, you know, I'm always I'm always struck. Um, you know, whenever whenever I have the chance to to you know hear about your work and hear about these projects that, that this this balance um, uh, this this tightrope act um, that you've been walking for 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 such a long time in terms of the just the the scope of the the problem uh, the scope of the 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 issue of, of these migrant deaths and the and the the emotional honesty that you, that um, that you bring to it in terms of understanding um, the families and the weight of their grief uh, and the weight of their uh, not knowing uh, what's happened um, to a family member or a friend um, and and. I, I want to come back to that um, uh, that issue, but 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 before we before we go to that place, um, uh, you know, I wanted to I wanted to hear a little bit more from you about you know sort of like how how you came to this project, how how what what drove you to um, to sort of think that this is um, this is how you wanted to spend um, uh, you know your 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 time, your energy, your intellectual and physical uh, labor. You know, it's a long and winding road, and I won't, I won't, go with, <laughs> with, with all the details. Um, but I, I will say that there were kind of um, a couple of fundamental things that really happened. You know, first, I've always attributed a lot to my undergraduate education at UCLA. Um, I really felt like I came out of UCLA really committed to anthropology and to thinking about the ways in which we could use the different tools from the tool set to understand the human condition. Uh, I ended up as a, as a senior in college going to Mexico as an archaeologist, which is what I did for many years before this, uh, working with, with anthropology professor Richard Lejeur um, in central Mexico. And it was through th that work and those excavations that I was on that I ended up getting to know a lot of people, working class women and men, who were digging ditches alongside archaeologists who, you know, uh, folks who had just come from the, from the Arizona desert, they had failed to cross or they were getting ready to cross. And they just began to tell me all these stories about um, the things that had happened to them. And it was a very, you know, eye-opening you know, kind of experience for me to hear these stories and, and to just be so moved by what people were telling me. And so I ended up really wanting to shift gears away from a sort of traditional archaeological approach and seeing whether or not I could use different tools from the anthropological toolkit to understand this contemporary and, you know, often highly politicized, um, you know, social issue. Yeah, and 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 that and that does go in a way to to one of the other questions that you know as 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 academics as PhDs you know there's this there's this kind of idea um, that um, 
you know, we're, we're supposed to be in this kind of, um, you know, objectivity and, and particularly, you know, when you're, when you're thinking about data in a kind of quantitative way, um, you know, and, 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 and I'm, I'm interested to hear about that, you know, how, how maybe your ideas about, you know, the kind of like objectivity of data um, and the ways that we represent that data, you know, have, have such an impact on, on how we perceive the, the scope and scale of a problem. Um, you know, how, how, you, how you approach that issue of, of um, uh, you know, subjectivity versus objectivity. I can imagine some, some anthropologists and other academics sort of um, thinking that you need to be a little more analytic um, rather, than, um, rather than so invested. Yeah. Well, you know, I think for me, I'm always wearing two hats. Um, you know, I'm, I am a, I'm very much committed to empirically driven research. I'm very much committed to doing what I would hope would be rigorous, you know, anthropological research um, on these issues. Um, but at the same time, you know, I mean, at the same time, I, I think that all research is political and we just can, we pick and choose how we, we make that known or not known. And so when, when someone says to me, oh, well, I study this thing in the ancient past and it's a very, and it, it's, it's, it's an apolitical kind of thing, you know, um, or has nothing to do with politics. I would, I would say to those folks, well, to call it apolitical is, a, is in fact a political statement. Um, and so for me, you know, I, I just try to embrace full on the fact that I'm working in this difficult political um, context where people are living and dying. It's very difficult to oftentimes to see these things and then try to theorize about them or write about them in a um, in an academic way, although I, I, I try to strike that balance. Um, but also at the same time, you know, I'm really trying to present people with with the the facts as I see them on the ground, you know, facts, you know, sort of loose term, but some, like something like, you know, Hostile Terrain 94, it's an emotional experience for people who, who sit down and write out the thousands of names for the dead and then construct this this wall map. But all they're doing is taking um, a Google spreadsheet, which is, you know, forensic data, which is, you know, um, date of, of recovery, cause of death, um, you know, people's names and ages. They're just taking that inform that simplistic sort of forensic information and, and handwriting it out and putting it into this different format. And something happens during that translation that gives people both, I think, this emotional kind of subjective experience, but at the same time, they end up constructing this wall that I would argue is relatively objective in terms of a lot of people die in the Arizona desert and this is what it looks like. Right. No. And, and I, and I think it's, you know, that's the, uh, that's the, the, the really incredible thing about that, uh, about that effort is, is that all you, you know, sort of like all you have to do um, is, uh, you know, fundamentally change the way that people are interacting with that data. And then you'll start to get a very different response to fundamentally change the way that, that people represent that data. Um, and then you'll get a very different kind of emotional response and, and, and intellectual understanding of the problem. Because as you say, it's like every tag that goes up, you know, the, the, the scope of the issue, um, you know, and the, and the, the, the impact that it has uh, becomes more clear. How, how did, how did you make that move? How did, how did you come up with that, with that idea to, to sort of like, Hey, let's, let's, let's turn this on its head a little bit. I wish I could tell you that it was well planned out and that, um, you know, <laughs> I've got it all figured out, but you know, like most things, it, it was a lot of trial and error, um, quite a bit of experimentation with, with hostile terrain 94, you know, we had done, we had done an, a, a big exhibition before that um, called State of Exception that I was, you know, that's where I sort of cut my teeth thinking about um, how to translate anthropological data into an exhibition context. But we had done a follow up show where one of the one of the graphics or one of the, the pieces was uh, was that was that basically that giant map I showed of all the red dots um, that we had made into a vinyl sticker and, and we put it up in this gallery and people were looking at it. And and I, I think they, they understood that those dots represented migrant lives that had been lost but i don't think that but they didn't quite understand the weight of that and so i got kind of frustrated with like i thought this thing was sort of failing and so i said okay let's take that down let's make let's make custom toe tags and we'll write we'll write out the information for the debt so people can can flip through and, and see that information for themselves and it can become this kind of tactile experience i asked about five of my undergraduates at the university of michigan to to start filling out tags um it took them three months to fill out you know 3200 tags but in the very beginning of, the, of that process, they started saying to me, this is really challenging. 
to sit here for an hour and write out the names of the dead. You know, I'm writing people's names down that that are similar to mine or people I know. I'm writing on people who are who are dead that were my age or you know people who were found on days that 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 I remember what I was doing on that particular day. Um, and so they were having these very visceral emotional experiences around it. And so I just thought to myself, well, what if instead of us making a wall map and asking people to come and look at this thing and, and you know in some ways just kind of gawk at it. What if we asked people to commit their time and energy to make one of these things themselves? Could they have that same kind of experience and then and then and and come out of it, you know, um, moved or or thinking about immigration in a different kind of way? Um, so we we did that. We we did the first version, which we did ourselves, and then I built a, a little website. I said, okay, let's see if we can get people interested. The exhibition is very cheap. It's you're just basically just paying for materials. Um, who wants to host it? And then suddenly, you know, we, we had 30 people who wanted to do it, and then we had 75, and then we had over 100, um, and then it, it just really spread. But I'm always shocked and, you know, and really humbled by this thing that I sketched out on a bar napkin, essentially, and become, you know, this this exhibition that's really that's really gone far beyond anything I could have ever imagined. And also, it's, you know, it's not me doing it. It's people taking taking ownership of this and, and making it their own, which, um, you know, I love that, that collaborative aspect. Yeah, yeah, no, it, it's it's incredible to see it, and, and even just to see, um, you know, the different parts of the U.S. and different parts of the world that that now you know have a chance to um, um, to to think about this issue, which you know, on the one hand, seems it seems to to us, you know, quite local um, in in terms of it being a, a sort of a U.S. Mexico issue. Um, uh, but at the same time, I mean, you know, you've had these experiences now working in, in, in different countries that have their own, you know, sort of like separate but related migrant um, challenges. And, and I'm wondering, um, I, you know, it, it's, there's a, sometimes, sometimes it's easier to talk about somebody else's problem um, as a way of getting to talking about yours. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm sort of interested to know, you know, what's, it, what, what's the conversation like in Starkville? What's the, what's the conversation like in, you know, a city in Germany um, in, in terms of thinking about this place that, you know, might seem very far away, but, but actually is much closer? Yeah, you know, I think that's a great question. And and it was something that I hadn't really anticipated in the beginning. I mean, I was shocked when people in Berlin or, you know, um, Frankfurt were like, we want to host this thing about Arizona here. Um, and what we found was that people thought that, yeah, like you're absolutely right, that they thought it would be a way to get their community to talk about immigration issues that seemed very, very far away. But then they could very much make it make it also local. And so part of the, the the work that we do with our hosts is to say, we want you to bring this to your community, but we want you to find as many ways as possible to make it feel local as well, to help connect the dots. Um, and people have done that in, I mean, in so many ways, like in Starkville and in other parts of Mississippi, you know, people were really connecting the violence at the US-Mexico border against these brown bodies to the violence that their own neighbors have been experiencing um, as a result of, you know, um, a series of very high profile ice raids. Right. In Germany, you know, it's, it's been very much about the ongoing refugee crisis with coming to the Mediterranean and elsewhere, but also the, you know, the refugee crisis of, of World War II. Um, and so, you know, those shows are happening in places that were, um, you know, used by the Nazis during World War II uh, and, you know, purposefully so that people could start to see these connections between, you know, people fleeing persecution and um, and seeking refuge um, and and um, and trying to get away from this violence. And so every single show is completely unique. And I think every community comes to it in in radically different ways. You know, the, the first show we did at University of Michigan, you know, Michigan is a Ann Arbor is a border town. People don't think about it, but I mean, we're very, very much close to the Mexico, but a very different kind of border. And, and and my students there, you know, most of them had no idea, even had never even been to the U.S.-Mexico border. Um, and so they, they came to it kind of as a, as a first time experience. When we, did the show, when we did a show at Cypress College in Orange County, you know, the the majority of our students were um, were, were Latinx students. And, you know, some of them themselves had crossed had crossed through this desert. And so they came to it with a very different kind of perspective and, and set of feelings. And um, it's just been really um, powerful for me to see how people are, are engaging with it and, and trying to find productive ways to, you know, to, to work with the exhibition. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I, and I think that that's, you know, it's a really valuable, um, 
it's a really valuable contribution in, in terms of like, in, in, in terms of like bridging that distance between, you know, the world of scholarship and quantitative data and a, and a kind of a research university environment, um, the ivory tower, if you will, and then just like real experiences on the ground for people. Um, and so, um, you know, I, 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 I just, it, it's, it's just a really, really impressive um, and really, really important contribution. Um, and, uh, you know, and I, and I, I want to give you a little bit more time to, to sort of, um, if you want, you know, to, to talk a little bit more about either, um, you know, those, those, those personal stories that you've gone through and, and, and the work that the Calibri Foundation is doing in terms of actually, you know, reuniting people, um, but as well to sort of think about that, that, that global context that you're now seeing as, um, as part of this uh, project. Um, in terms of, in, you know, those, those longer term causes, um, um, you know, you know, whether it's, whether it's climate change or, or different kinds of um, instability, like how you, how you see this, how you see this playing out now in 2021 and how you, how you, what kinds of things do you think we need to be looking out for um, in the, in the not too distant future? Yeah, I mean, I think, unfortunately, what we're looking at in Arizona, that's our future globally is f hundreds of thousands of people dying f because they can't they can't stay where they where they are because of you know political instability corruption um crushing poverty and increasingly the the the, the devastation that's coming with with climate change i mean we could think about honduras you know in, in Central America in the last year being pounded by back-to-back -back hurricanes after and still reeling from from Hurricane Mitch in 1998 those things are only going to get more um, uh, more and more uh, terrible and people are you know these places are, are, are becoming completely unlivable and so you know it's either drowned in uh, or die of starvation in in Honduras or take your chances in a place like you know the Arizona desert and I think we're only going to keep seeing this more and more, and we're seeing it globally. I mean, we're seeing it in the Southern Mediterranean, the, the Eastern Mediterranean, um, North Africa. Um, we're seeing it in South America. I mean, people coming up, um, you know, from Haiti through South America, across the Darien Gap. Um, this is, I mean, it feels, I don't know if, you, if, pe if people have seen the movie, um, you know, Children of Men, um, you know, where there's a scene where all of these refugees are being beaten back. I mean, and, and we're already living that. Um, you know, two years ago when people are trying to, uh, uh, request asylum in Tijuana and Mexicans are there, you know, throwing rocks at these Central Americans. I mean, this is a, this is something that that we have to prepare ourselves for. And um, and clearly border walls are not the solution to this because um, because they they don't stop people. They're they're a waste of money. And then they fail to address these root causes of things that oftentimes the U.S. has a, has a big hand in, um, in in helping along. And I think it's important for us to think about these issues at a global scale. But then also try to think about you know the individual lives that are shattered because of these things. And so for me, um, you know, as a researcher and as a whatever, as an anthropologist, or I don't know what I, you know, a person that wears many hats, I'm always trying to move up and down between those scales because I think it's important to understand the big picture and the root causes and the effects. But then also, um, we need to understand how people experience these things on an individual and personal level because um, because I think oftentimes when we, when we think about it in, in too grand of a scale. It both is, it feels too overwhelming, but like, how are we gonna solve all these things at once? Um, but then also I think it it removes us from from really empathizing with the individuals who, you know, and we very much, you know, in California, I mean, we're dealing with climate change now, right? In, in New Orleans and, and, and Florida, I mean, these are places that are gonna be impacted. We're gonna start to see people fleeing those, look, we already are seeing them do that. Um, so I think we, we by able, by moving back and forth and then trying to, connect to those individual stories, I think is, um, is, is an important kind of first step for, for having a more nuanced understanding of what's actually going on. Right, right. And that personal connection helps, helps close the gap, you know, helps, helps make it real, helps, helps make it, um, I mean, hopefully, you know, the, uh, uh, you know, a situation that you can empathize with a little bit more as you're, as you're trying to understand, um, you know, your own individual role, our own individual role in these larger systems. Um, uh, well, um, it seems like a moment to, to sort of, uh, you know, maybe open the floor to, to some of the questions we've got coming in. Um, and in fact, one of them um, 
uh, is um, coming to us from, from the UK. Um, uh, so um, asking if Americans realize that America's interference, and, and, and I think it's important, you know, just in this context that, um, uh, you know, when we say America, we mean the United States. America, America, um, for a lot of different people in different parts of the hemisphere, means the, the hemisphere. Um, the U.S. has kind of appropriated it in some ways. Um, uh, but the U.S. interference in Central and Southern America, um, for example, uh, what happened in, in Chile, um, has led to the migration crisis. And I think you were alluding to that in, in terms of talking about natural disasters um, uh, like earthquakes and, um, and like hurricanes. Um, but I think, I think this question points to, to uh, these other kinds of historical moments, whether it's going back to the 19th century and understanding how um, the, the, the development of the U.S.-Mexico border um, kind of leads to some of these um, uh, moments of, of activism and response where it's, you know, essentially the, we didn't cross the border, the border crossed us. There were so many, um, there were so many people who were already living um, in what became the United States, um, indigenous people as well as um, uh, people who uh, would identify more with the, the Mexican government perhaps, um, but also other events in the 20th century, whether it's the, the our Ben's coup in, um, in Guatemala in the 1950s, um, you know, Central American interference in the, in the 70s and 80s. Um, um, so, you know, you know, you know, it's kind of like, well, I think, I, I think to, to partly answer this question, uh, I think some Americans do, um, and I, um, but I, would be interested, I, you know, how, how much of that comes up in your, in your own teaching and your own, um, research, understanding U.S. interference as a, as a root cause? You know, it's, it's an unpopular truth that I think a lot of, <laughs> a lot of Americans refuse to recognize, um, and I, you know, and there is there is constantly this idea of like, well, that's those people's problems. I mean, we talk so much about how corrupt Mexico is, the drug war, um, but I'm like, who's buying the drugs, right? Where are the guns coming from? Um, Where's the money coming from? Yeah, I mean, uh, we talk about like instability in, in a place like Honduras, and then it's like, well, Honduras has been the way that it is politically because it's because we make it that way, and we've been heavily invested in keeping Honduras as a kind of, you know, a, um, subservient state to, to U.S. interests, especially um, during the war against, uh, the, during the Cold War. Uh, but I think a lot of people, you know, they want simpler answers. And, and unfortunately, they get them from other places. And so when, when, when someone like Trump or, or some other person says, hey, a wall can solve all these problems, that, that prevents you from having to think about these more political, these, these much more complicated kinds of issues. I mean, we cannot have comprehensive immigration reform, I think, until we have we have economic and political stability in Latin America. But people want to think about that as like wholly separate, and we and you know, and those things are intimately twined. I mean, our own economy is intimately entwined with with labor from Latin America, and so it's it, you know that, that's a hard sell though. And I think that um, that for so long the system has been invested in not having people understand that. Um, because it's easier, it's, it's much easier to um, to sell someone a border wall, um, and, and than it is to sell them like let's help Latin America um, for various reasons. And so you know we're we need to get to that point where we where we can both lay it out, understand it, but then accept it. And there are people who just don't want to accept that either. You can no matter what I could tell them about you know this is why things are the way that they are, they still don't want to accept it. And so there's this kind of also this this pushback from um, you know I I just don't believe it. Right. No, and that's going to be that. That's that is the harder one to. Um, uh, that is the harder nut to crack for sure. Um, uh, I've got a couple of other really good questions. Um, one, a real basic nuts and bolts one. Um, uh, how much does it cost to test DNA um, to identify, uh, you know, one individual? You know, that's a good question. For various reasons, we have to use the same DNA lab that um, that the medical examiner uses in Tucson, and which is a, which is incredibly expensive. I mean, um, we could do, you know, in, we, like we could do DNA analysis um, on campus for for sixty dollars a sample, um, but but the medical examiner um, and the people who are doing the comparisons they, they don't want us to do that. They want they want us to go through through their channel. So it ends up being. One individual sample can cost as much as seven hundred fifty dollars per sample. Um, if you send them in bigger batches, that you know that gets that gets 
cheaper and cheaper. Um, but because of the, the smallness of our budget, you know, we're never able to send more than 40 or 50 samples at any one time. Um, so, you know, we can get it down to, to, to maybe three or $400 per sample, but then keep in mind, it's not just the DNA sample. We have to pay for, you know, we've got the, the body with DNA, um, but we also have to pay for the family reference sample. We have to go and find families of the missing, take their DNA, oftentimes from multiple family members, and then run that as a point of comparison. Um, and then there's other fees that, that come in with, with running those analyses. But then also, you know, a huge chunk of our budget has to pay for staff time because these cases are very complicated and have to be managed. So someone's got to answer the phone. Someone's got to be going to, to collect the DNA. Um, so, you know, I think for us to resolve one of, the, one of these cases can, can cost anywhere between, between four and sometimes eight, nine or $10,000, depending on the location of, of where people are coming from and also depending on, on our budget at the moment. Um, so, we're, you know, it's, it's kind of an uphill battle that we're, we're constantly trying to find ways to, to cut corners, but, um, you know, it's incredibly um, um, expensive and time consuming. And, and that's just the first step. You know that 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 you know in terms of actually, you know because then then I can imagine that there's this this other subsequent process that has to happen in terms of working with uh, working with family members, working with different you know municipal you know state national governments um, to to make something like the the repatriation of an individual. Um, you know, like that that that's also not an inexpensive process in terms of labor and costs. I would imagine. Yeah. Um, we've got a we've got a um, a good uh, you know question a complex one about um, the the language and um, in, in a kind of a humanitarian sense of the of the need to save migrants from drowning in the sea um, has has resulted in a, in a in a different kind of diversion uh, different forms of detention and block, blocking um, so that we don't see those pictures in the media. Um, and that 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 often that often pushes um, this kind of violence into into different places. Um, and the reference here uh, to Libyan detention centers um, in the in the Mediterranean region. Um, uh, and and so the 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 questioner you know has a has a concern a fear that that progressive rec rhetoric quickly gets co opted to create even uh, potentially even greater insecurity and violence. Um, and how do you, how do you as a scholar how do you teach that that kind of complex issue um, and and maintaining um, you know as we're talking about these 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 oncoming issues with respect to climate change a space for for hope and responsibility um, and accountability. Well, you know, it's a great question because you see it happen time and again where, um, I mean, I, I guess a, a good example would be, you know, right now, sort of post-Trump or even towards the end of Trump, right, we were we were seeing how brutal the conditions were in these detention centers for, for children, right? Children who were separated from their parents were, were keeping them locked up in these, um, these really awful kinds of places. And then one of the responses was, well, okay, um, detention is bad so let's send them back to mexico where they can wait to apply for asylum but being sent back to mexico as a form of protection is actually the complete opposite now now we put them into refugee camps where folks who are legally trying to apply for asylum you know are having i think their right their rights violated by being put in these camps and in those camps there even there's a higher likelihood of assault murder um robbery, um, and yet that is sold to the public as this humanitarian sort of thing. I mean, and I've, I've written about other policies. Um, there's one called the Alien Transfer and Exit Program, where migrants were caught in a place like Calif like you know, t uh, San Diego, and they were being flown to a place like Texas or Arizona. And the idea was, well, we want to get them away from their smuggler because the smuggler is going to force them to try to cross the border again. But in fact, we send them to the Sonora Desert, where now the path of least resistance is to now try that crossing. Um, but these things are sold very much as these as these humanitarian, um, you know, kinds of projects. When in fact, I think that they are designed to to inflict more harm. But yet, they they offer a very good sort of cover, um, you know, through the, through the language that we use to describe these things, or the the, you know, this is how the policy is going to play out. Um, but then when you see it happen in, in reality, it's it's having the complete the the, the complete opposite effect. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's um it's a challenging set of issues that you you know that that you're facing that your your team um, is working through and the and the folks at Calibri are are you know working hard to to resolve on that on that on that very personal and familial level level. Um, 
uh, we've got, you know, it, 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 I'm, I'm seeing lots of other questions coming in, but um, and they're really good and powerful ones. And to me, that's a suggestion, um, you know, just how, how complex and how, um, uh, you know, how, how, how serious uh, this issue is and how, how seriously people take it. So um, unfortunately, though, I think, I think we're, we're running out of time. So we might just have to have Jason back for, for, um, for round two sometime. Jason, thank you so much. Uh, really appreciate you taking out the time out of your schedule to, to join us this afternoon and walk us through this. I learned a lot. Thank you all. You know, and I, and I will say that um, if folks are interested, they can go to our social media, um, Undocumented Immigration Project. We have a Facebook page. We're on Instagram and Twitter. You can follow me on Twitter. Um, and we do, we will have a, an upcoming um, live webinar um, on, that'll be Facebook streamed where I'll be talking with our staff from Colibri who will be talking about the nuts and bolts of the work that they do um, and will answer a lot of the questions that I just saw um, pop up in the in the, in the the Q&A box. That's gonna happen, um, I'm looking here at my calendar here. It's later this month, um, I can't seem to find the date, but it is um, it, it is going to happen in the next not next week, but the week after, I believe. So people can check our website um, or our social media for for updates on that. Yeah. Thank you both so much for spending this last hour with us, Jason. The work that you're doing with the Undocumented Migration Project is bringing light to an issue that's been largely invisible. So thank you for harnessing the power of art to bring awareness to the issue. Thank you all. And thanks to everyone who joined us. This program has been recorded. It will be available immediately on our Facebook and in the coming days on our Instagram and on our website for you to revisit and share as you see fit. And we hope that you'll join us again for our next program this Friday. It's the last month of Latinx Heritage Month. You can find details on the closing slide. Thanks everyone. I hope you have a good night. See you next time. Bye everyone.